Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Harry Nahadis. I'm the president of the East New England chapter of the Vertical Flight Society. Welcome to our latest edition of the webinar. Uh, and we're very, very lucky uh, this month to have a terrific guest speaker who I will introduce uh, shortly. Uh, but before I do that, uh, I'd like to thank a few people. I'd like to thank Jim Sherman from the Vertical Flight Society headquarters for assisting us in, in putting these webinars on. Uh, this is, I think, the third or fourth one we've done. And, uh, and they've just worked out very well. I think we've made the best of a bad situation uh, with the pandemic and people not being able to uh, have dinner meetings. And so uh, thank you, Jim, for uh, all your help in, uh, in allowing us to put these on. Uh, also helping me uh, behind the scenes uh, in this webinar, I've got two people. Uh, one is uh, both members of our uh, board of directors for the, for the East New England chapter, uh, Scott Hanula who's going to uh, collate questions for us and, uh, and ask our guest speaker the questions uh, as, he, as he looks through them and looks for common themes and tries to streamline that whole process. And so Scott, thank you uh, for doing that. Um, likewise, we have Lauren Wolf, who is behind the scenes uh, handling the audio and visual. Uh, that way uh, our speaker can focus on speaking and not trying to figure out how to flip the charts and change over from audio to video. So uh, thank you, Lauren, for, uh, for doing that. Uh, you know, lastly, I'd like to encourage people to join the Vertical Flight Society. You know, there is uh, really, we are in, uh, I would say, unprecedented times with regard to what's going on in our industry. Uh, between uh, the technology that, that is going into the urban air mobility uh, segment, as well as the Army uh, modernizing their fleet of, uh, of helicopters is just uh, providing just incredible amount of opportunity in uh, in our industry and so i would encourage you to join the vertical flight society and be an active participant you know the vertical flight society is first and foremost a technical society and so uh, along with that you get to network with like-minded professionals uh, both in terms of sharing ideas as well as potentially even uh, even getting new jobs uh, you also get as a benefit of joining uh, terrific magazine. Uh, VertiFlight magazine is an uh, industry-leading magazine. Uh, terrific writers uh, really keep you on the uh, on the cutting edge of what's going on in our industry. So uh, it's just a terrific publication. There are also a number of technology symposium during the year. You know, it culminates in the forum. Uh, you know, the annual forum. Uh, this year, the forum was virtual. Uh, next year, we'll see where things head here, uh, depending on how the pandemic kind of plays out. But, uh, you know, the forums are another place where uh, the primary goal is technical interchange. There are a number of competitions also as part of the Vertical Flight Society. Uh, current uh, competition that uh, they're accepting applications for is the Licton Paper Competition, which is uh, reserved for people who have never done a paper before. They get judged on, uh, on various criteria. And if selected, they get to present them at the national uh, forum. Uh, and so, uh, again, I would just encourage you uh, to uh, to join uh, Vertical Flight Society, or at least investigate it. Check us out. It's uh, it's a lot of fun, and it's uh, it's a great society to be part of. Uh, you know, I uh, I'd also like to thank our sponsor for today's presentation, uh, and uh, GE Aviation is our sponsor for today. Uh, sponsoring uh, Dan Schultz's uh, presentation to us. And uh, unless we have a technical difficulty here, I'd like to introduce a uh, representative from GE Aviation, uh, Mr. Tony Mathis, the president and CEO of uh, GE's military business. Uh, Tony, I'd like to invite you to say a few words on behalf of General Electric. Oh, great. Uh, thanks, Harry. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, look, I, I have to admit, rarely if ever, Will I ever volunteer, ever, to speak at an event, ever, uh, Dan, by the way. Um, but when Harry told me about today's program, and he told me that it not only featured one of our most important customers and partners, but Sikorsky, but he also said that Dan Schultz was the keynote speaker. I kid you not, I volunteered to speak before Harry could ask. And I never do that. I just never do it. But for Dan and Sikorsky, I, I absolutely wanted to be here. Look, Dan, there's no one in the rotorcraft industry that we respect more, 
that has more credibility and who we trust as a partner more than you, Dan, and, this, and the Sikorsky team. It's just a fact. You know, here at GE Aviation, our purpose statement is we invent the future of flight, we lift people up, and we bring them home safely. Our helicopter engines are the backbone of our GE Aviation military business, and we've supplied engines to Sikorsky for over 60 years. Throughout that time, Dan, we have invented flight together. It's just a fact. You know, our partnership with Sikorsky began back in the 50s uh, with the T-58, uh, that part ACE-3, yep. and grew, as many of you know, significantly uh, as we part the, the CH-53 uh, uh, C, uh, C stallion with the T-64, we part the, T, the uh, H-60 with the T-7, T-700, and the S-92, as well as the YT-706 um, for the Raider. And we are proud to provide our next generation of helicopter engines to also uh, part of the future of flight, whether it's the T-408 for the CH-53K or the T-901 for the Raider. We've successfully worked together with Sikorsky for decades, developing new products for our customers all over the world. But from a personal perspective, Dan, having your leadership at the forefront of almost everything we've done over the past few years has been phenomenal. Dan has been a tremendous friend. He's set the bar high, which has made us a better company. And he has been there to support us when it counted the most. I genuinely uh, appreciate Dan's transparency, his leadership across the entire industry, and after his distinguished service in the Marine Corps, his service to the Sikorsky Aircraft Corporation and all the support for our shared customers, Dan, I want to personally congratulate you on your impending retirement. Dan, the entire General Electric company says thanks. Uh, you made us better and we wish you all the best as you head off into your next chapter. Thanks, Dan, for all you've done for us. And thanks, Harry, for letting me take a few minutes here. You bet. Thanks, thanks, Tony. Uh, and now uh, I'd like to introduce, formally introduce our, our guest speaker today, Dan Schultz, president of Sikorsky Aircraft. Uh, Dan joined Lockheed Martin in 2006 as the vice president and general manager of the Ship and Aviation Systems Division. He later was promoted to his current role leading Sikorsky Aircraft. Uh, prior to joining Lockheed Martin, Dan served on active duty in the U.S. Marine Corps, where he was the V-22 program manager, uh, in addition to many other leadership roles. Dan is also a pilot at heart, and uh, in that picture, uh, Dan speaks volumes. Uh, Dan is a former H-53 pilot, and we've heard many stories, and I'm sure we'll hear some today, uh, of Dan's adventures uh, flying the 53. Uh, Dan is also uh, the former, now, uh, president of the uh, National Vertical Flight Society. Uh, and uh, Dan, I can't thank you enough for joining us today to give your talk on the future of rotorcraft speed, autonomy, and safety. Well, this is, I hope you all can hear me. I'm off mute. Yep, we hear you. Well, first of all, Tony, uh, that's about the nicest thing anybody's ever said about me. So I, I appreciate that. I appreciate our relationship. Uh, we go way back together. Uh, good times uh, all. And Harry, I, you know, you know what I think of you as well. Um, I wanted to start this off with, uh, you know, uh, that young guy that was in that picture. I, I don't know who he was. In fact, uh, you know, there was an old Irma Bombach story that said whenever they wanted her, wanted her husband to lose weight, she changed her son's underwear for his, and that way he would start doing it. And I think uh, after looking at that picture, I might have to go on a diet here uh, coming up. Um, but boy, what a, that lifetime of uh, flying has always been amazing to me. And we're gonna talk today about the future. And uh, I'm gonna show you a little bit of, uh, I like to say in Sikorsky, we always look at the future, but we keep one foot in the past. So. This is a picture of our Raider flying, um, and let me get into this brief. Next slide. Oh, I know this will work. There we go. So I wanted to start it out with the T-64. Uh, 
you talked about uh, your long history with us, uh, Tony, but I can tell you, and there's a lot of people in the, on this call that are Marines and have been uh, flying your products uh, around the world. Uh, I've flown uh, this engine in places that you wouldn't believe and distances that we just still have hard time understanding. And I told somebody the other day, the marriage of a GE engine, especially this T-64, and a Sikorsky helicopter is probably the safest thing that was ever designed and ever developed. Your engines never let us down. We, I never once worried about the reliability of that aircraft when, when we got into it and flew missions and went and did it. This is a picture of us all picking up the very first 53E up at Sikorsky. Uh, <laughs> I, I laugh at some of the pictures of, of these guys in here because you know we had Larry Wald, his father was Lou Wald, the most decorated Marine ever. Uh, real characters, Bill Mullins and Ronnie Johnson and Bubba Strickland, and it just goes on and on. Those were those were some of the early guys that flew your product around the world. And I will tell you, when we put that third engine on the 53, the power lifting off that just was staggering, and we could lift uh, just about anything. Um, my favorite story has always been the EA6B rolled off the runway up at uh, Atlantic Field one day. Those things were pretty expensive. And they didn't know what they were going to do and how to get it out of there. We said, well, we'll go get it. And they went, what do you mean you'll go get it? Oh, we can get it. And so we had to lift it, drain it a little bit, drain a little bit more, get it up there. And but we put it back on the runway. And so we did go get it. Uh, I don't think the Marines had ever really seen heavy lift before. There's a big difference between heavy lift and medium lift. And we showed the, the Marine Corps what that meant. OK, next slide. Uh, I thought that we'd talk a little bit about where we currently are, and then I'll talk a little bit about the future. The first video I want to show you, and I, the, the technology doesn't let me talk over the video, so that's probably a good thing for most of you. But this video right here is a picture of Cougar Aviation. I tell people all the time, when I go up to Stavanger, Norway, and up in, uh, in Newfoundland, um, what our helicopters are doing, this 92 and your engine is flying aircraft 220 miles out into the middle of the North Sea, out into the middle of uh, the Arctic uh, environment. It's rough, terrible, tough weather. They start up every morning, they fly out 225 miles and back, and then they load up again and go back out again every single day. And it doesn't matter what the weather is. And I'm gonna show you a picture of 19 guys, we won't show you all 19, getting on board. And when they give the video, uh, I mean the briefing before you board the aircraft, I've sat in on them, yeah, I'm used to the commercial aviation, you know, where you, you're, you're already working on your iPad before they finish the uh, here's where your seatbelt and, you know, flotation under your seat. In these briefings, people are actually taking notes. They're writing and asking questions. And let me tell you something, putting on that wet that suit, that dry suit that they have to wear is no easy thing. My goal for all of us in Vertical Flight Society and building helicopters, whether your Sikorsky, Bell, Leonardo, you name it. Our goal should be every single person that's taking that brief ought to be playing on his iPad. We've got to make the aircraft so safe that people won't worry about it. These 92s that we're going to show you a video of here, I'm running right around 96% availability on those aircraft. And when I talk to my commercial customers, they say, what are you doing about the other 4%? This is the mindset we should all have about readiness and safety of our aircraft. So. Without further ado, take a, a quick run through this video. I think you'll enjoy it. Well, I know, I am I back on? Can you hear me now? Okay, I, I'm yeah, assuming you can. 
for all of us helicopter pilots and for all of us helicopter people who love helicopters, you can appreciate what that means right there. Um, and to do this every single day is uh, is shocking to me about how reliable uh, our aircraft are and the people believe in them. And when I talk to the pilots at each of these sites, they go, what are you talking about? This is what this is how we go to work. So pretty telling for all of us at the Vertical, Vertical Flight Society. Next slide. So this is the other version of the 92. We haven't really rolled out a lot about this, uh, but this is the 92. It's the same aircraft you saw over there, green aircraft. Um, it went through Opaval, and it the first time uh, the Navy will tell you that we actually went through an Opaval where the airplane was up the entire time. Uh, the reliability on it was amazing. It is truly, when you get up next to it, such a beautiful helicopter. Uh, I'm very proud of the Navy uh, giving us an opportunity to build a helicopter for the president. It's going to change the way he flies and what he does with it. If you've if you ever get a chance to see the inside, if you look at our older uh, version and look at the newer version, you'll be staggered. It is stunningly beautiful and it does the mission. So I'm very proud of this. Our team is very proud of this. Um, you're going to see a lot more of these flying around coming up soon. Next slide. So I wanted to show you this um, uh, slide here. Uh, go ahead and pop up the, um, uh, the uh, in-flight refueling slide. So this is the CRH, the Combat Rescue Helicopter of the United States Air Force, and in-flight refueling. Um, this airplane, uh, the, it, I used to say it's not your grandmother's Blackhawk any longer. We took uh, the, with the Air Force and redid the entire outside. It's got a gun system that's amazing. It's got long-range extended uh, uh, fueling tanks, and it has the capability to in-flight refuel uh, with a very stable AFCS that's on board. This aircraft is going to change the way the Air Force flies. It, we had to really modify the nose of it. If you ever get a chance to see uh, the aircraft close up, uh, to get the cooling for all the equipment we put on it was a, a challenge for us. But it's a, it's a bottoms up change and uh, we're very excited for the Air Force and uh, we're already starting to deliver them. And uh, there'll be 110 of these coming out and we're very excited about this aircraft uh, going forward. So. Black Hawk continues to change even as we uh, as we develop other aircraft. Next slide. This is the 53K in-flight refueling. It's got a 27,000 pound load underneath it. Um, back in the early days, uh, I was able to in-flight refuel with an LAV underneath. And uh, I can tell you that it, 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 we, in retrospect, we might not have uh, had to do that too many times because I, I, that was about as scary a thing as I think I've ever done. For all of us that in-flight refuel, you know, uh, you, it's hard to brush your teeth the next morning because your arm is so sore from holding that stick. When I talked to the pilots, both the Marine and, the, and our test pilot that flew this mission, they plugged three times, just bang, 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 got in behind, got in pre-contact, pushed it in, came back out. And I, I said, you guys must be amazing. Uh, they said, hey, Dan, I got to tell you, it's a, uh, you put yourself in the position, you tell the airplane what to do and it plugs. And he said, we think this is a non-event. And I said, you're in a test airplane with a 27,000 pound load in flight refueling behind a C-130 and you're telling me it's not a big deal? It's what they told me when they came back from the desert flying in complete brownout conditions. They said, well, it was a non-event. This flight control system, I tell you now for all helicopters, Fly-by-wire systems are going to change the way we fly and the way we think. We have a Canadian helicopter with it. We have the 53K with it. All of our new uh, aircraft are coming out with that. It takes all these components off the aircraft that are high fail components, and it gives you a much, much, much more reliable and stable platform, and you could tell the aircraft what to do. Even for all of us that flew 53s or even when we flew um, any of the Hawks, you had to adjust your um, seat all the time, be able to see over the dash, and but the stick never changed. And so you would sometimes have to have two or three things on your arm to hold the stick steady. I can't tell you the number of times when people have gotten the PAO where you pilot assisted oscillations by the load, all of that's gone. The flight controls are in the seat. So when the seat moves, the aircraft moves. And so you don't have to have 10 things under your arms. But more importantly, 
you're not pushing the trim button anymore. You tell an airplane what to do and it goes and does it. Um, and I, I'm going to talk a little bit about autonomy and safety coming up in another slide or two. But let me just tell you, this 53 is setting the standard. And I challenge all of you out here in the sound of my voice, we need to start talking about generations. The jet guys have done this for years. You know, when you talk about the F-22, you talk about the F-35, they'll say these are fifth generation aircraft. And when you talk about a fourth generation, you quickly say, well, yeah, okay, that's fourth. This is fifth. And helicopters, we don't do that. You know, we we have some helicopters been around since before I was born. And we have to start talking about the next generation of helicopters. I'll tell you right now, this 53K, this is a fifth generation helicopter. Raider and Defiant, they're fifth and sixth generation helicopters. They're changing the way we're going to think about things. And they're a big difference between an ordinary straight up helicopter we designed back in 1960. This is not that. This is much different, both in sustainable and in the future of its capability. And not only that, it's going to be a safer aircraft as well. Okay, next slide. This is another use of uh, that I'm extremely proud of, and all of you uh, that work in Sikorsky believe that the same way as me. And I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about the factory workers that work on, on Blackhawks. We put together this thing called a Firehawk. And I know that you know the, the fires are raging in California. Some of you may even be out there. Um, I got a chance to actually do this mission. They let me uh, put the snorkel in. a. You're allowed to go into a swimming pool and fill your tank up, 1,000 gallons in one minute. And boy, I'll tell you, when you're in a hawk and you put a thousand gallons on in one minute, it's like somebody jumps on your back and you can feel it. But the other end of it is when you drop it, it's exhilarating as hell. I mean, it is an amazing system. And because the Black Hawk's so powerful, uh, when those winds get up to be 60 miles an hour, um, th these hawks are up there. They're, they're the only ones that can take those kind of winds and drop in that water to, uh, for the hotshot teams or just uh, it's a real uh, evolution to watch. If you haven't seen the Hawks in action out there, uh, we're now, we've are now we sold several of them uh, to uh, LA County, to CAL FIRE. They are, those pilots are flying missions like you would think are truly combat missions. They're, they're coming back completely covered in soot. They're flying 24 hours a day. They fly at night in these night missions on these fires. And when you're over a roaring flame like that in a helicopter with a thousand gallons of water, you can feel the heat. So I'm very proud of this. Um, our team is very proud of it. And uh, we all should have our hearts out for these pilots that are flying these missions. Next slide. So um, next one. Uh, so the next thing I, I wanna talk about is autonomy. So everybody talks in general terms about autonomy and I'm excited about that, that almost everybody in their industry is working on that. And, and, and frankly, we should be. I don't, uh, I think of autonomy in two different ways. A lot of people think of it as a complete unmanned aircraft and and I get that. And you, there are, uh, uh, we did this with KMAX over in the, uh, many years ago uh, and we proved that we could do, you know, logistics lists and stuff like that with a remote controlled aircraft. But our concept of autonomy is a little bit different. And you see two aircraft there, one's a 76, the other's a Blackhawk. What we really think about here in Sikorsky is optim optimally piloted aircraft where the co-pilot is going to do all of those functions for you. And what that means is like, it's not going to be like the, I tell people, it's not like the airplane movie where it inflates, but every of all those small tasks where the, you had to have another pilot to do that. Now the pilot can focus on the mission because all of the other things are going to be handled autonomously. And the, the benefit for this is going to be single pilot aircraft operating with a safety net of a dual pilot aircraft. We've already teamed up with our um, our company in Lockheed Martin out in the Skunk Works and worked with the F-16 on a recovery. It's called Death Claw. If a pilot passes out, the airplane will bring itself back up. We are doing things with the opt optimally piloted Blackhawk where if anything happens to the pilot, the aircraft will come back. and uh, the system is so redundant, it's going to be great. My other uh, exciting part about safety for this is the aircraft will know. If you're on a 300-foot downwind going into a ship at night, and it's pitching and rolling, and you're chasing the lights, you're seeing them all, all the lights, and the lights go out, and then they're back, and you're, you're, you know, you're a young co-pilot trying to come in on that left turn, and you know, you're heading to the water, 
this that cold pile is going to say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, you're not, we're not doing that. And the collective is going to come up, and you're not, you're not going to hit the water. You're, you're going to have an opportunity to change the the pile is going to have an opportunity not to fly into the ground. And so, uh, autonomy is going to be to vertical lift. What uh, what the airlines had when they started getting um, a uh, a much more uh, directed uh, flight path when they've been operating. And so this is a great way for us to bring safety back into our community. Next slide. And so now, now I wanna talk a little bit about the future. And I talked about safety and, and autonomy is gonna bring us safety. The other thing that's gonna bring us safety is, um, is reliability. And what our commercial uh, fleet has taught us in Sikorsky is the commercial model of how do we take all those lessons of the future and bring them in to make aircraft more reliable. And so we had three pillars in Sikorsky, speed, autonomy, and intelligence. And our home systems have proven that's how we got 96% availability in commercial, how we're bringing that back to the Seahawk, which is in the high 90s. This is how we're using the future uh, of AI and intelligence uh, and ex especially big data on the usage part to make our aircraft more reliable. So we had speed, autonomy, and intelligence were our three pillars. We're now moving, uh, since we think we've, we've gotten those in a box, at least uh, now, and what we wanna do next is we wanna maintenance-free aircraft. Uh, we, we wanna take this to the next level. It's not unusual to have a, a 777 fly across the Atlantic, take you to Paris Air Show, you know, hose out the cockpit, fly back, pick up another load, go back again. There's no reason why helicopter aviation can't do that. You know, it's little things uh, that I've always uh, been after. Like if you were on a 53, uh, a lot of our non-53 people had a little name for us that I didn't like very much. And it was because we kept dripping hydraulic fluid and dripping oil in the back of the aircraft. And I can remember taking uh, VIPs and you know, especially naval officers in their white uniforms and they'd all be striped with, uh, uh, you know, orange hydraulic fluid. And I said to our team when I first came to the company, we can't have that, that's, that's crazy. Um, do you know the 53K, 2000 hours of flight test? We haven't had a single leak in that aircraft, not one. And we're changing the way we're thinking about helicopters in the future. Some other companies already advanced far, farther than that. We have to do that as a community. Reliable, safe aircraft. And these two aircraft right here, our two development, Defiant and Raider, are gonna show you that. We're gonna show speed, we're gonna show maneuverability, and we're gonna show reliability of the aircraft going forward. Uh, already, when you look at these rigid rotors, um, we've taken so many dynamic components that fail out of that rotor head system, uh, you could pile them up on the floor, it'd be a big pile of them sitting there. So that's gonna change the way we look at it. Uh, Raider, when it flies, it's so dynamic. Um, it, when I fly the simulator, they won't let me fly the aircraft, of course, you know, I don't know why that is. I, you'd think I'd have more power in the company, but when I fly the simulator, I, I feel like I'm in that Will Smith movie where he's uh, uh, Independence Day, where he flies that spacecraft out of there. He goes, I gotta get me one of these because that's what it feels like. The acceleration is so amazing, but, but not just with acceleration comes maneuverability, and that's what we're really excited about. You're gonna see that. We're already demonstrating it now. The other thing is that it, these aircraft are quieter than you would expect. They'll they'll sneak up on you. And we flew one for a demonstration that came over the back of our heads and I didn't even know it was there until it flew over the top of us. So having that pusher prop uh, makes a big difference. And I think that these two aircraft are a next generation. Uh, I'm excited that the Army has challenged us as an industry to build absolutely new aircraft again. And I think that's good for everybody. It raises everybody up. So I'm excited about this. It's been uh, a lot of fun developing it. And uh, I think you're gonna hear a lot more about Raider and Define in the future. Well, I, I think I stayed on my time, uh, Harry. I'm open for any questions or Tony, if you guys have. Okay, uh, thanks so much, Dan, uh, for your very interesting talk. Um, so now folks, if, uh, if you have a question, if you could enter it into the chat uh, function, on your uh, webinar software, there's a box on the upper right there 
it should uh, have a little chat uh, thing and, and type it in. And uh, Scott, if you could uh, you could come on and maybe uh, ask those questions uh, of Dan for us, that'd be great. So Harry, I don't I don't have any yet in the system. They'll probably be coming in as people type them in. Okay. Um, but I did such a good job covering a, there would be. <laughs> no, I would yeah, I, 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 I should have uh, I should have uh, mentioned I, the chat thing before you talk. So, but. Uh, yeah. In the meantime, would you like to show the video of the Raider flyby? Or oh yeah, we didn't get that. I'm sorry. You know what? I was the I thought that the click technology again. All right. Let yeah. Let's show the Raider flyby. That'd be great. Meantime, uh, put your questions into the chat uh, chat box. I, can you, am I back on? Yep. Hey, so hey Dan, it's, it's Scott Hanuel. I have some some questions have come in. Yeah, sure. Um, the first one is it's it's hard to imagine Sikorsky without Dan Schultz as president. <laughs> but, <laughs> but if you can reflect for a moment, what would you say the one thing you're most proud of while leading the company, and what's the one thing you're looking forward to most in retirement? You know, that's a those are very nice softballs. I bet somebody on my staff asked those. Uh, <laughs> I, I won't reveal names. I, I would say that the uh, the thing I'm the most proud of is integrating uh, Sikorsky inside Lockheed Martin. You know, I don't I didn't talk a lot about Lockheed Martin, but what it's meant to Sikorsky has really been uh, staggering. Uh, first of all, um, they have been incredibly accommodating and investing in the company. Uh, if you ever get a chance to see the factory up in Stratford again, uh, once COVID lifts, I invite everybody, including uh, other companies, to come by. Um, you will not recognize the plant any longer. The capital investment for the 53K and for future vertical lift has been amazing. Uh, the technology that Lockheed gave us, for, I'll give you a good example. We used, to, we used to have to strip the president's helicopter down when it came back to us to, to rework it. I know a lot of you are involved in that. The numbers of gallons of 55 gallon drums that we used to have to use to solve it to take all that off, now we have a laser paint removing system that Lockheed gave us on the F-35 program that has the uh, frequency of the paint. So when you, you you push the laser, so you know about that wide comes down and all there is is some crumbs left. And if you push it over your hand, it doesn't hurt you because it's the frequency of the paint. So now we have a mason jar of paint left instead of all that uh, stuff we used to use before. And that's just one. I could tell you a dozen stories that you would just be in the 53K is coming together as a digital aircraft. Uh, we don't have a single piece of paper out on the floor. Everybody's, it's like the you go to the hospital with the little uh, carts. So the one I'm the most proud of is integrating um, Lockheed and Sikorsky together. I could speak Lockheed because I came from there. I used to build ships with them and lasers and stuff like that. So I could translate to Sikorsky what Lockheed was saying and what Sikorsky was saying to Lockheed. Now, I wasn't always successful, but uh, most integrations, and a lot of you are involved in that in our industry, when you buy another company and bring it together, it's not simple. The culture, you don't want to lose what's the best. And, you know, Sikorsky has a hell of a culture that goes way, way back. And, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time with Sergey talking. You know, he, he used to tell me, Sergey's 95 years old. He, he tells me that his father used to argue with Orville right in their basement about Rory Wing flight. And I'm going, you don't want to lose that. At the same time, you want to... It, you know, take and embrace the technology from Lockheed. So that's a good combination. Perfect. Um, the next one is, um, if we can achieve 96% availability in the commercial world, why not in the military aircraft, which I think yeah. 
it's on something you were talking about earlier on. Yeah, so um, it's not impossible. Um, it's uh, there's a lot of barriers inside of the military. First of all, the military flies aircraft a lot different than the commercial world does. So when you look at our guys flying the, the 225 miles out and back, every single aspect of that flight is measured and uh, they control it. Uh, they follow the aircraft. That, that, you know, they're not yanking and banking at 10 feet and landing in a dusty zone and all those kinds of things. So. And when you put that over here, that that is a, a a challenge. Military flying is not commercial flying. However, uh, there are so many techniques that the in, the commercial industry demands that you have to design in. It's really almost impossible to try and put hums into an aircraft that's already built. Uh, we tried that on the 53, uh, Harry, with the 53 with your engines, even you know, and it's not as easy doing that as it is designing that usage data in. And then using the usage data is probably the biggest problem. I can't believe that, I tell you this story, I, I'll repeat this to everybody because I think it's one of the better ones. We had a woman that was working for us in, um, in our intelligence group. And we had Admiral, um, I don't want to speak his name, but the significant Admiral uh, came to see us and he was concerned about readiness. And she stood up and she hand, had this wrench in her hand. She said, Admiral, this is a million dollars I'm giving you. And he goes, what are you talking about? How can that be a million dollars? She goes, well, we've analyzed when they were working on swash plates, um, when they were torquing it back down, this wrench was designed. And if you the torque slipped a bit, it would chip the swash plate. You're allowed to blend it out once, the second time you scrapped it. But nobody was tracking that. Big data came in and we see this spike and all we did was bend the wrench so when it slips, it didn't hit the swash blade any longer. We didn't replace any swash blades. These are the kind of things that are staggering when you look at it in our industry, but we didn't, we don't have the data usage that we need in, in commercial models. I have every single piece of data. On the military side, not so much yet, but we're working on it. And going forward, uh, collecting data, data can can change your life. It, it makes a difference. I know GE does this a lot in their commercial engines. And on their military side, we're asking for the same thing. Right. So a very similar question to kind of maybe a sort of a follow-up that's in the queue is um, what what is Sikorsky doing to make general platforms easier to maintain in austere environments? Yeah, so it's um, it's always a, a challenge. You know, one of the biggest problems is uh, ingesting sand in, in engines, uh, ingesting sand into the uh, uh, into the aircraft. Uh, if you're an aircraft like the 53E and you're completely wet with hydraulic fluid and you land in a sandy zone, which unfortunately just about everything in the Marine Corps is in sand somewhere, in the Army is the same way, uh, and then you fly back out and you're now grinding sand against everything. And for those that have had to do rust busting and fix the maintenance on the aircraft, those, those are those are tough. When our 53K came out of Yuma, it looked like it was brand new. Uh, the sand just fell off of it. And and you when you wash salt off of it without it being attached to hydraulic fluid and baked on with 100 degrees of temperature, it's a much easier uh, ability to maintain the airplane. But more importantly, we, design, we have to design the components of helicopters to, to stay on the wing longer. And the way to do that is by this HUMS data. You know, we've already extended the life on multiple parts because we now know what they're going to do, not what we predict them to do. And we don't pull them off because uh, the we don't, in the past, we wouldn't understand what was wrong. You know, we would say, okay, we got a fault in code and we'd go get it, couldn't figure it out, send the box to mail, send it to, back to the depot and come back A799, I can't duplicate that. On the new aircraft we're building, 100% fault uh, detection, 95, 96% fault isolation. So not only do you know what it is, but you, you now know what's wrong with it. And because the HUMS data is working, it's already re got the part replaced and already projected back for me to be able to maintain it and send it back out. So. The systems are changing. It's, this is not your grandmother's helicopter stuff any longer. Great. So uh, uh, another one out here is, um, how do you think carbon emission requirements and reductions will affect future rotorcraft operations? You know, that's a tougher one for me. Uh, you know, I, uh, there's a lot of people working in electric propulsion today. Um, 
uh, across the Vertical Flight Society. Uh, there's many startups looking at electric helicopters. Electricity is a, a game changer, can be a game changer. Uh, battery technology is not ready yet. Uh, don't worry, Harry, you, you, you know, we're not getting ready to yet. Um, it's, you know, it, it's good. There's a long time before battery technology gets enough to be able to carry a person. And if you just think about a commercial flight from Stratford, Connecticut into New York City, out to the Hamptons, when you look at that, when you need, it, it just say one pilot and you got to carry two passengers and have that kind of battery, that, that's a long way off. So carbon emissions out of our engines and, you know, Harry, you're probably a better one to answer that than me, but um, we're, I'm not looking at uh, replacing 53K engines with electric engines anytime soon. Yeah, reducing fuel consumption is the best way we know uh, today to reduce carbon emissions. Uh, so, and, and I agree, you know, the way I usually answer that uh, question about electric power is it depends on the mission, really. So if you don't have to fly too far, uh, and you've got some time in between flights, it'll work fine. But uh, if you want to fly today's missions that we typically fly, battery technology is, is a one or two orders of magnitude uh, yeah. below the energy density of fuel. Yeah. Now, there are, there are opportunities to take power you know, from a carbon emitting engine and convert it to electric power. So you, wouldn't, uh, you can you know, change gearbox uh, requirements, but... Uh, I don't see a battery taking over yet. So we, we have a fair amount of questions kind of centered around the uh, future vertical lift. And uh, um, I'll, I'll paraphrase and put it into maybe one or two questions. Really is around with the large number of aircraft involved. Um, how are we managing that? And what do you see the down select coming down to? Well, uh, you know, it, whenever you're in a competition, it, it's easy to talk about your competitor. And I, I try not to do that. I, I have a lot of experience with tilt rotors in the, in the past. And um, I think this is going to be a great competition for our, uh, our society as a whole. Uh, we, I, I compliment the Army on challenging us all to think for the next generation. We haven't had this before. You know, this is so exciting for all of us. I mean, you're bringing your best date to the party here because this is going to be a game changer. Uh, and so I'm excited that we started advanced blade technology in Sikorsky many years ago. I stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm a, a blip in the radar screen of development of aircraft because they take so long. And having this kind of technology, I'm just grateful that I was alive to see the change in helicopters we, we've been the tyranny of uh, retreating blade stall our whole lives. And the tilt rotor goes through a different op option of it. And, and this advanced blade concept with our uh, Raider and Defiant changed the direction in another way. And this is uh, this future vertical lift for all of us in this community. We should embrace this because this is a changing of us. It's going to be, we'll never be the same after this. So um, along those lines, um, how is business, how is b doing business with the U.S. Uh, uh, Marine Corps uh, changed since you took over leadership of Sikorsky? <laughs> I, I, the Marines are, uh, you know, I, first of all, I'm a Marine, so I, you know, I, I speak Marine. Uh, <laughs> I think that the Marines have been uh, great customers. I, they, when the Marines say they want something, it's not like they are thinking, well, you know, I really don't want that. You know, they're for all of us who work with the Marine Corps and the Navy and Nav Air, and I, I'm a Nav Air fan. I've you know, lived at Nav Air uh, for a long period of time. Nav Air is a very disciplined organization, and, um, and they hold us to high standards. Like uh, uh, Tony said, you know, I, I hold GE to high standards, not because I want to, because they can. You know, not everybody can stand at the, at the level that GE does. And so Nav Air holds everybody to the same standards. They don't pick on anybody. They're and, and they have a customer, the Marines, who really know what they want. So well, in this business, what's better than that? All right. And then there's another one here about um, with the softening of the commercial market, what is Sikorsky uh, targeting for the future of commercial flight? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. I, I will tell you that the commercial market, when we first bought the company, uh, we were predicting a B recovery. You know, then it became a U. Now it's more like a rectangle. Uh, the 
who can predict the price of oil? You know, commodity marketing is, I, I carry an app on my phone of the price of oil, uh, Brent crude, and you know, it, it changes uh, how uh, aircraft would be bought by the number of rigs that you're going to service. And uh, there was a spike a couple of years ago where they were opening up Mexico to do more uh, oil exploration and then uh, oil prices tanked again. Uh, for us, it's been uh, it's a good thing uh, that we have an aircraft that is large and can fly long distances because uh, the usage on that and even distance to COVID distancing because it's so big inside, they can uh, take people out to the rigs. But now we're seeing that uh, they're staying on the rigs longer, the 14 day quarantine to come back. So they're not rotating as much. Um, we're still we still fly 13 heads of state and we get pretty regular um, um, uh, request for new VIP air helicopters and new search and rescue helicopters. And we just introduced, and I, I'm really proud of this, because back when I was talking earlier on those flying off the oil rigs, I wanted us to have an aircraft that you don't have to be worried about ditching. I don't want to spend money developing a better wetsuit. I want to never get you wet. And so one of the things we've done is we developed a run dry gearbox. We call it run dry, it's not actually run dry, but if you lose oil pressure in the, in the 92 with our uh, S92A and B, these, uh, these new transmissions will fly. We ran one for seven hours with the FAA observing it. And it, we put it back in the aircraft and it flew uh, uh, perfectly fine. And so we're, we're starting to see uh, oil companies requiring that now going forward. So we took two land immediate emergencies out of our uh, book with these uh, new transmissions. To me, that's the commitment to safety that we're looking for. And I, I know if, if I was an offshore oil worker, uh, that would make me feel a lot better every day getting on a Sikorsky part. So the next one I have is um, how, how does any kind of AI or optimally piloted aircraft change how we think about system architecture and certification or qualification? Yeah, so, you know, in, in order to do anything um, uh, today, you have to, uh, to get any kind of type certificate, you're going to need the FAA to be part of that. And we have a commercial venture with a very large company to look at fixed wing and helicopters to go to a single piloted aircraft. Um, there's a pilot shortage right now, as you probably know. And uh, there are, uh, there's also an economic uh, component for when you're trying to move things. Um, like imagine if you're a, a, a heavy cargo aircraft, if you flew from San Francisco to Hawaii, um, what a perfect opportunity to have a less than optimal, you know, two sets of three pilots in there, right? You could easily do that mission. Uh, so our goal has been, we wanna make autonomy a, um, an enabler and a safety uh, piece. Uh, so we want autonomy to take the workload off the pilot and have a safety component and allow the pilot that's operating the mission, because we don't wanna take him out of there or her in order to make it um, a, a safer, more mission capable uh, aircraft and take huge amounts of weight out. And so that's, uh, that's what we think uh, the future looks like. Great. I have a couple of themes. Um, and, and the one will be a comment, the other one will be a question. One, one of the themes is uh, thank you very much for doing this and for your service and leadership at uh, Sikorsky. I see a lot of that coming through. Um, the, the other one is when it comes to these future vertical lift offerings, does that seem like it will be the ubiquitous solution, kind of like the Blackhawk, or will there be multiple platforms across the board? You know, it's, uh, uh, it's probably better to ask the Army that question than me. Uh, uh, I, I, if, if, I, if it was me making the decision, uh, defiance some Blackhawks would blacken the sky. Uh, I, I look at these aircraft and how they operate and maneuver. They're like a helicopter uh, that is uh, a, a super helicopter. I mean, it flies like a helicopter, acts like a helicopter, does all those kinds of things. It's very maneuverable. And with that pusher prop able to go forward and backwards, uh, that gives you all kinds of capability. Our, our test pilots talk about when they make that turn, 
uh, and you use you, the the prop just changes everything as you go in there. And I, I think the engineering to have both rotors go forward together, keep the distance between them solid, and because they're rigid, they say this flies like a fighter, but it maneuvers like a helicopter. So when you get that kind of combination, it's going to be pretty exciting. And if um, you watch a we have a couple of demonstration videos when they come in zorching in at over 200 knots and then they throw the prop in reverse and they just stop. It, you'll you'll start to see what we're talking about. And Raider, when you it, it, one of the demonstrations that comes, I have to use my hand. It comes down like this with a nose down, like 35, 40 degrees nose down. It just hangs on the prop. And you think about if you're an attack helicopter, what an advantage that has. So you don't have to show them your belly when you roll off. It's pretty exciting for for transport and attack. I think it's it's going to be exciting for the army too. So another uh, commercial question is about how uh, how long until we have autonomous um, urban air transportation and how much will Sikorsky play in that market? Yeah. So autonomous uh, transportation by helicopter. I I just heard today that Uber uh, is not going to pursue. Uh, <laughs> um, unmanned cars, you know, so, or autonomous cars. And so I think that, I think the FAA on the F, on the 737, uh, coming back from that, they've been focused on that. And so coming back into the commercial market, an unmanned helicopter transporting people, I think is a ways off yet. Um, I, I don't know, Harry, and you know, how GE thinks about that, but it goes back with electric, uh, powered unmanned helicopter and controlled airspace. Already, it's uh, some of the big cities are already sensitive about helicopters anyway. And so I think that uh, unmanned transportation of people are way it's off yet. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe, uh, so maybe one more, Scott, uh, one more question. Uh, okay, uh, one more. Let me see. Um, so what, what's been the most, uh, the greatest technological challenge in developing the Raider and the Defiant? Yeah, I think that that's a good, a good question too. I think, um, you know, the key to every helicopter, uh, every vertical helicopter is transmission. You know, Harry will tell you it's the engine, but uh, you know, you, you can't do anything without, I, you, you know, GE is so good at what they do, we already assume that that's gonna be there. <laughs> and, you know, not notwithstanding the engine development, believe me, it's a, that, that's a technical thing that I can't ever get my head around how they ever do that, uh, it's amazing. But when you go forward, um, it, the, the technology that's available today, we've never had before. And so that's gonna make all of our aircraft different. Already, we're seeing technology now change everything that we're doing. Uh, when I was first flying a helicopter, we had nothing like this. We were so excited we had a, an AFCS uh, button that we could put on, you know, oh my God, look at this, it, 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 we have an outer loop now. That we have changed the way helicopters are going to be flown in the future. They're going to be safer. They're going to be faster. They're going to carry more. They're going to be more intelligent. And they're going to be able to interface with other helicopters. And they're going to be able to uh, tell themselves when there's something wrong with them. And they're going to tell you when they need to be fixed. And all of that is, is not pie in the sky. It's happening right now. We just hadn't put it together. There was not a program to do that. Now the future vertical lift is going to do it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Very good. And uh, again, uh, thank you, thank you, Dan, so much for your interesting talk and uh, and for agreeing to speak to our East New England chapter of the Vertical Flight Society. I know um, when I asked uh, if you'd be willing to speak, uh, one of your assistants got back to me and said, you know, Dan recently announced that he's going to retire uh, at the end of January. And uh, in this, this is going to be one of his last speaking engagements. And I, and I guess I'll just say, uh, you know, I'm honored that you uh, that you agreed to do this as you know one of your last speaking engagements. And it was a great talk. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, wish you all the best uh, in the future. Thanks, Harry. My pleasure. I appreciate that. Good luck with GE. Thank you. And folks, uh, stay tuned for our, our next uh, webinar. We're targeting toward the end of January. And uh, we've got uh, we got some ideas on uh, on another uh, very very exciting speaker. So uh, watch your email box inbox uh, carefully. Okay. Uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. Bye bye. Bye.